Hello, 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 everyone. And welcome back to another episode of Speaking Legally, where the legal meets the cultural, with our two co-hosts, co-hosts, <laughs> Edward Pichardo Esquire and Royce Russell Esquire. I'm still in celebration mode. It's Libra season. It's my birthday. So the yes. celebration continues. Yes, it and is. I appreciate you all tuning in each and every week to be here and be a part of our conversations where the legal meets the cultural. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there's so many things going on in our communities every day and in the news. So not for lack of content, we're able to discuss the things that are happening and what we're experiencing in real time with two of the experts who deal in these areas of law every single day, advocating for us and our community. So welcome back. Hey, Dan, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate you. Uh, we'll let our co-host say hello. Mr. Royce Russell Esquire, over to you. Yeah, I'm playing with this camera, but everybody, hello, trying to make sure we get a clear pick so we can uh, move on. But uh, welcome to another segment. We want to uh, clean up some points and mention some new points today. Absolutely. And Ed? Uh, uh, hey, folks, listen, the, the, for some reason, the power just went out where I'm at here in Albany. I think it's it's pretty much going to be impossible for me to participate at this point. Um, but I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. So listen, I, I just want to, Oh, it just came back on. Okay, Look there at we that. go. There's nothing else to do. Speaking legally in real time. And it went back out again. Well, you're doing fine on your phone, brother. And we yeah. just see your face, so keep on going. It's all right. We'll keep... <laughs> he'll there come we back. Right. Yeah, he'll, he'll come back. Some technical difficulties, but he's taking care of some very important work up in Albany. So we understand technology happens. These things happen. This is live TV. So we will make those adjustments and when Ed is able to come back on, we'll continue the conversation. But there's a lot going on in the news as per usual, unfortunately. And there's a couple of points that we were talking about for discussion today. So let's see, where do you wanna start, Mr. Russell? A lot's happening in the Bronx where we both grew up. There's some things happening with the judges. Which one do we want to attack first? Well, we just want to make sure that everybody knows that, you know, what's going on in the world out here, right? I mean, although we're not a news uh, outlet, but we're talking cultural and we're talking legal and we, uh, the two are meeting. And so what's happening in the Bronx? My stomping grounds, your stomping grounds, New York City Live. Uh, we have uh, the attorney general uh, uh, starting an investigation on the Bronx County Clerk, Luis Diaz, suspended amid investigation. Now, for those that don't live in the tri-state area, or at least don't live in New York, uh, the Bronx County Clerk is a very, very, very powerful position. And it's a very, very political position. And if anyone knows the politics in the Bronx, uh, the Democratic machine, uh, for better or for worse, runs the Bronx. And whoever they are backing in some shape, form, or fashion rarely lose. So the fact that the Bronx County Clerk, which plays a very important role within that party, is being investigated and had to step down, although he's still getting paid, had to step down, is of great importance. And so that means that, one, either there's truly something criminal going on at foot, and if it is, then I would imagine that it would have to deal with either with some type of kickbacks or some type of political shenanigans. And anybody who's followed Bronx politics, there's always been some issue with what I call, it's my turn next. And that is, is that people believe that they have a turn and when, it's, when they believe it's their time, they wanna be next despite what the people might think, despite what the community might think, and despite the fact that we think that there's power in numbers and there's power in people and the people's opinions reflected in the polls, that is often not the case because opinions can be persuaded. And although I may have an opinion and I live in a community, 
I may not have the ability to vote because I'm a felon. I may not have the ability to vote because I'm here illegally. I may not have the ability to vote because I'm a legal permanent resident. And then if those are the case, or if those issues come to the surface, although one might want to do good for the people, the issue becomes whether or not they will have the power to put them in place to work their plan that they had planned to work from the beginning. And so when you see an investigation with a party and party members, I would tell you that the investigation did not start tomorrow. And this is my 20 something years as a lawyer practicing in the area of criminal defense and defense work, that there were probably a whole lot of targets. And when I say targets, assembly people, council people, uh, clerks of the court, uh, administrative people, uh, people behind the scenes that we don't even know of, um, that we may see their name on a piece of paper, uh, whether it's a will or whether it is a seal. Um, those people were probably targets and probably had to come in and talk and say a thing or two to help the investigation for which is now pending. Now, is this unusual? The answer is no. This is what happens when you're dealing with the attorney general and you're dealing with the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice. That's how they build their cases. They build their cases off of people that are caught in the tangled web that they have weaved and they cannot get out of. And the only way to get out of it is to talk about their next brethren or sister. And so you better believe somebody was doing some talking for Mr. Diaz to be caught in the web. Now, he is receiving pay. That's a good thing. The article doesn't really reveal the essence of what he may be charged with and what the investigation is about. But like any good stock tip, once it hits the news, that means it's already been floating about for a very long time. And so that is just the tip of the iceberg there, okay. Dr. Grant. That's that's interesting. Um, you know, I know our attorney general does a great job at what she does, but it's interesting how this is going to pan out in the political circles. A lot of people are very concerned and it's almost like opening up Pandora's box. So this is one of those stay tuned uh, to see how this plays out, what actually comes about, like you said, with the charges. And hey, Deborah, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate you. So. And what's let me just let me just interject what is critical about this also is that a lot of people don't do not know this. And if you follow Bronx politics, you know that I think next year, I want to say next year, the seat for borough president is vacant. And so how does this all tie in? Does it tie in? You have some young folks, some innovative folks that might be seeking that position. We haven't heard of any front runners. But when you have an investigation like this, or a pending investigation, the old guard might be on guard in that their position is not settled, that, you know, that they better look for new employment. And how much will the quote unquote allies and friends that people think that they have within the political chain will stick their neck and hand out to save this individual? And I'll just extrapolate to the situation in Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon, you had the mayor in Mount Vernon who was charged with and was convicted of some, some type of, uh, I don't want to say em embezzlement, but misuse of campaign funds to pay for personal use, uh, to pay for a car, to pay for electricity, to pay for things of that nature. And when that litigation started, there were already people lined up that were ready to give testimony against the mayor. One, because they probably was caught in their own special situation. Uh, you could, when the light shines, when they say, shine a light on them. Yeah, shine a light on them. Yeah, but, you know, the light was, was shown and we weren't talking about a birthday, right? And so once the light is turned on, and, and 
I hate to use this, but I will use it because it is part of the culturalism that I come from. Like the roaches, once you turn the light on, the roaches scatter. I mean, they're everywhere, right? And the attorney general is trying to kill as many as they can before they get to the hide, the, the cracks in the crevices and disappear. And that's how I would describe these investigations, <laughs> right? The light is turned on and people start to scramble and the slow at foot, they get tagged, they get brought back, but to their benefit, they, then most times they're able to give information to further the investigation. And I think in the case of Mr. Diaz and what we have read so far and what has been in the media that um, he probably knows who's on the list of, as they say, snitching, right? <laughs> for better or for worse. Uh, and so, you know, there's more to come with that. And it's, it's interesting how that will tie with the borough presidency because we know um, that Ruben Diaz, he's, he can't run again. And other people have to move out of the way so new folks can come in. Interesting, interesting, interesting. What they say, it always comes to light. So, That's right. Definitely. But in addition to that, some people got fired. What's going well, on? Yes, 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 yes. So here are the 46 judges being terminated by the New York court system. Now, before you show their names, right? Because I think it's important to show your names because they, they may be listeners out there or viewers out there that may have one of these judges presiding over a matter. And lo and behold, the new judge might take over. And when I say new judge, I don't mean a newly hired judge. I mean, the cases that they have are transferred to a new judge. And so therefore, now you have to deal with someone coming up to speed with your case and litigating from there. We'll talk about that. But why are these judges being fired? I think it's twofold. One is what I call the COVID effect. Basically, New York, to a certain degree, is starting to hit points and, and pivotal points where they're forecasting where they have to cut costs and where they have to save money in order to keep the city up and running and it moving in a certain fashion. I think that is eminent. I do think there is some opinion that now is the time to get some people off the payroll. And what I mean by that is that there's always been in most city, in most governmental and state um, agencies, this theory that I, all I have to do is just hang on. All I have to do is just hang on. If I just hang on, I can stay here for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. That hang on theory is now putting, is being put to the test because folks can no longer hang on. When you hear about the 46 judges, see the title is a little bit misleading, right? 46 judges. So you think like, wow, 40, 46 judges. <laughs> no, of the 46 judges, almost all of them are of the age of 70 and above. Now, that makes a difference, right? Uh, if you're practicing law this long and you're the age of 70, then one would say, well, why are you still staying on? Even though you have all your, your mental faculties and you might like the job that you're doing, but 70 and above, and, so, and I think you must retire by the age 79. Uh, and I think the article speaks to that, 79 or 76, one of those two numbers. And so when you have these aging judges, Although they're equipped to do the job, um, the new regime, you have to make room for the new regime. And you take COVID issues that has been hitting uh, New York economically, although we know that in New York, they, we do not have a friend in the president right now. And if Biden, would, if Biden wins, then we will have a friend again. And therefore, New York will receive some federal funds, you know, to alleviate some of the pressures. In the meantime, in between time, this is a very business-like, non-age discriminatory way to say farewell to all those who are over a certain age. And for whatever reason, maybe they just really love their job. Maybe they really need the pension. Um, it's time to say goodbye. And... If you know, we have to realize that when we look at the number 46, 
that's a misleading number <clears throat> because for every judge that is there, there is a law secretary and a law clerk. And some of the judges have senior law clerks and junior law clerks. So you can take this number by 46 and you can multiply it by at least three, if not four, if you consider the secretary. So four times 20, that's, that's what's that? Four times six, 24, put a two of it as eight, that's 10, that's 104. I mean, like, you know, I went to Catholic, I went to Catholic school. Shout out to St. Anthony on, on, on Trenton, Trenton Avenue right there, you know? Um, you know, you do the math on it. So you're talking about more than 46 judges. And uh, Dr. Grant, if you scroll down, I think there's some names that might be uh, here, here, right? And uh, can we, uh, what's some of the names there? I think Robert Johnson, former Bronx DA. His oh, wow. Let's see. Yeah, he is there. And hey, Richard Russell, thank you so much for the compliment. So we have Honorable Friedman, Gasner, Cohen, Leventhal, Maltese, Devine, Roman, Barbado, Robert T. Johnson, yes, your former boss, Miles, mm -hmm. Sherman, Tapia, Adler, Barrett. Wow, this is a long list. Yeah, and what's curious, and we can speak to the cultural part on it, I only heard one Johnson. So a lot of those names is not reflective of those that's in the community. That's for sure. Um, I don't see no Smiths in there. I don't see no Russells in there. I don't see no Pachados in there. You know, I think you might have a Torres maybe or a Diaz somewhere. And there's uh, an Esposito. Esposito, there you go. Um, but that can go cut, that can cut both ways, right? Um, you know, we just want to look at facially sufficient. Um, so, I mean, that is taking place. And that means that where there's a loss, there may be opportunity. So, whoever's the next mayor, Eric Adams, because that's the only name that I can recall that's running for mayor. Can you recall of anybody else who might be running for mayor? There's a few, but I know that uh, Eric has been in the forefront of conversation, but he is not the only one. It's it's a pretty open, oops, pretty open ballot there with who is throwing their hat in the ring. You know, when you have these open races, everybody wants to come in, but we have a question. Who elects the judges? Are they ever elected by civilians? Thank you, Deborah. That's oh, a well, great Deborah, Deborah, let's answer this question. Who elects the judges? You elect the judges. Can you believe that or not? That means all this time that you've been on this earth, and we're not going to say how long you've been on this earth, Deborah, but I was gathered to say you've been on this earth quite some time, that when you walked into the poll, when you went to vote, there were names where judges, where people were running for judge. And you may have just said, oh, I like that name, Taurus, or I like that name, Russell. Or you may have ignored it totally. You may have pushed the button based upon last name because clearly resumes weren't out, right? Um, and they made the ballot by getting signatures and petitioning throughout the county. Now, I say that judges are elected, but judges are also appointed. And they are appointed by the mayor. The mayor has a certain number, I cannot recall right now, they have a certain number of appointed positions for which you are appointed, and that is that. You sit there, and I think you sit there either for 10 or 14 years uh, when you're on appointment. Uh, those that are elected, I believe it's every two or every two to four years, you may have to go back for re-election, and usually once you're elected, uh, you run unopposed because no one is seeking that position and next thing you know you're there year after year and you know that's how it works so you control who becomes a judge when it's that when it comes to the elected judges so now here's the here's the uh what we call a trickle down effect right ronald reagan right the trickle down effect you have judges that are now being terminated you have a system based upon COVID that has been bottlenecked. You have a system in one county, in particular the Bronx, it might be in other counties, but in one county, the Bronx, and it's just overwhelmed with cases. So if you can imagine a Coca-Cola bottle, you have all these cases down at the bottom and they're trying to squeeze up through the top and it's very narrow in the top. Now what you have done, COVID, 
made it even more narrow to get the cases that were possibly ready out of the system so you can free up the bottom. Now, by, by determination of these judges, you have now put a top back on to the Coke bottle. Not only did you put a top on it, right? COVID put the top on it. Then what the city has done by terminating these judges is basically have shook the Coke bottle. The Coke bottle is now shook. And we all know what happens when you shake soda. We all know what happens when you shake there was that carbonated water. What's going to happen when you open up that top? It's going to explode everywhere. So here's the explosion. You have 48 less judges. That means you have other judges that are taking on other cases. And here's the culture and the human aspect of it. If I have 69 cases of my own, and let's just say Ed right now, who is not on our feed, let's use him as an example, he's terminated. And now I got to carry his cases and my cases. I am going to be annoyed. And that annoyance is going to make its way to the parties that are before me. It's just a human aspect. We can't deny it. Actually, we can deny it, but we know it's the truth. It's the human aspect. Because now you're looking at cases and you're like, I've never heard this case. Let's use one of our favorite listeners. I never heard this case, Johnson v. Johnson. Whose case is this? Oh, that's Ed's case. Remember, he, uh, he got terminated, so we got to take over his case. That's right, silence. Exactly what you heard. You heard silence. You heard silence. Because now, what is this case about? Why wasn't this case dismissed? How can we resolve this case? Why do I have to deal with his BS? What was the last thing that was done in this case? Oh my God, nothing was done in this case. Oh my God, a lot was done in this case, but then it was dropped. Now, that versus my own cases that I have, the cases that I'm going through, the litigations that I'm going through, that only makes for bad blood. And it could make for a bad result. That is the human aspect of it. And the reason why I keep on going back to the human aspect of it is because I'm concerned in our community that we don't really, or we're not really in touch with the human aspect of it. You know, we're really like not in tune when we walk in the courtroom, what is it all about? And let me make the transition to a phone call that I had today in real time. Someone called me um, in reference to doing what they thought was the Article 78 because some issue happened with a family member that was in prison. I'll just say that much, right? And so, you know, I had the conversation with them because they wanted to hire me. And I had the conversation, which is real talk in real time and speaks to the culturalism, whether they had the economic wherewithal or not, is I had to explain to them that being a lawyer in private practice is a business. And there are business decisions that lawyers have to make as to what cases they take and what cases they don't take. And where's the finish line and whether or not you have the financial wherewithal to maintain it. So why do I say all this? I'm making business decisions. The judges are making business decisions. And every business decision is a little less detrimental as far as financial, might be more mental, in reference to, I have to deal with this case. I really don't want to deal with this case. It is not my case. I have my own cases. Mm -hmm. And if the city were to hire new judges, without, which I expect that they will, once the city really gets on its feet again, um, those new judges will not be 46. <laughs> we all know when everything recoups is always half of what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So 46 was let go. Probably 24 is going to come. And 24 is going to come at a cheaper price. Right. And that 24 is going to get the brunt of a variety of cases and going to be told here, handle it. Now, that's a better case scenario than what I just described because the 24, one, don't really care whether or not that they're coming at a lower price point. Number two, they're happy to be there because they've been probably going to be a judge for a very, very long time. And three, they're going to make sure that their place in history is cemented 
on fairness or whatever because the case is brand new to them. How does that reflect to us as a people, as a person, as a plaintiff or defendant? To me, time is deadly and it's all bad news because now you might be starting from scratch with a judge that has to come up to speed with the facts and you might be paying out if it's an hourly case or if it's a contingency case, uh, motor vehicle accident, slip and fall, even a civil rights matter, you've been waiting for a long time for the case to be settled and resolved. And that's bad news because time is not necessarily, time is on your side, but you don't feel like time is on your side because you want the matter over and therefore a settlement number might not be in your best interest and you'll take it just because I want this to end. I was looking at some of the names that are being let go, especially here in Queens and you know some of the ones in the Bronx. This is a big impact. And for people who do have cases, like you said, we're talking about the human part of this and where the cultural meets the legal, people are gonna be loaded with more cases, frustrated, and that could play out any which way but loose with a defendant. Oh, Lord, I don't know. Yes, and then, and then, and then let, me, let me add to that. The law clerks and the law secretary, see, the article speaks to those that are over 70. That doesn't mean that the law clerk is over 70. That doesn't mean that the secretary, law secretary is over 70. Where do they go? What happens to those people? Can you find positions for them within a state agency, city agency, or do they have to go to the open market? That's interesting. That's a whole nother layer. And once again, this COVID effect, now we have more people who are unemployed and have challenges. Um, Deborah said, I get the story here when the civilians come and say, my lawyer was not there and they gave me a new lawyer who doesn't know my case. Yeah, that's the same. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely, Deborah. Right. Deborah, thank you for the compliment. Yes, this is the new birthday look. And, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then to Deborah's, to Deborah's statement, who is they? They gave me a new lawyer. Yikes. Who is yeah. that? <laughs> Who's the they? That's the truth. And hey, Dion, hey, Sora. She wants to know, um, seems like bad business to let go of so many judges at once during this time. How will this be felt by the communities? That's a great question. Well, once again, like I said, the frustration, uh, you know, we edit this show and then we don't edit this show. <laughs> Shit flows down. So that's what's going to happen. This shit is going to flow down. And there's going to be a lot of people that's upset that they're getting these new cases, which translates to, same thing when we talk about a cardiac arrest, right? You know, cardiac arrest, we talk about the transfer of emotions, right? Police officers having a bad day at home, and then they come in contact with you. That bad day and those bad feelings and the fact that they were late or they were docked or their son is on drugs or they're getting a divorce or, you know, they're going to lose some vacation. That bad feeling is going to transfer to you. Now, will it happen? Will all the judge judges do that? No. But I can tell you the human effect says that a lot of judges that are now getting these new, these new, new cases, that will happen. So that's the effect on the community. And I do agree with you that maybe they need to be um, uh, one branch, one leaf approach, right? You let go three or four criminal judges and you let go two or three Supreme Court judges on the civil side. Uh, you let go four judges in the Bronx, you let go three judges in Brooklyn, you let go two, everybody's gonna get let go. But like you said, you stagnate it, right? Over a period of time, um, even though the article states that I think the savings to the city was somewhere either between three hundred million or five hundred million dollars. It's a lot of money for some folks that could retire, right? Possibly, and get health insurance for the rest of their life, um, and receive a pension for the rest of their life. Um, so there is some cost benefit analysis that says this. $500 million or $300 million could be used in the city in another way. I would say use in our community, but you know, that's a fallacy. That's a falsehood. That's a whole link. That's a bad We can keep, hope. We can keep hope alive. We keep hope alive. You never know what might happen. Yeah, just to, right. give, 
that, you know, I understand we got to keep hope alive, but just hope keeps on changing her address. So I can't <laughs> never find her. You know, that's the problem. That's, that's we're we're going to keep, she will find her. We're going to keep it alive and we're going to keep doing the work that we're doing, sharing this information. So that's one for you to definitely just watch what happens because if you have people who are affected by the criminal justice system, this is going to have an impact. There's no two ways about it. And in every borough of the city of New York, for those of you who live in the New York state area. But and, they, and, and maybe, I'm sorry, Dr. Grant, maybe there's an opportunity for those who are listening to have their family members or themselves who know about this and now they can look up the article, right? Um, and they can see which judges are being terminated and they can ask their attorney, hey, are, what is the judge that I'm before on this list? That's number one. And number two, is it in our best interest to do a summary brief of what has taken place with the case up until date? How smart and novel is that? That you can bring, you can do a summary brief stating what has happened with the case up until now. If I'm a judge that's getting new cases or old cases from other judges, um, I may already be disgruntled. N nothing would really make me smile more than a summary sheet from somebody that's involved in the case that says, Judge, this case started in 2019. We had several uh, settlements discussions. The last number that was floated was, let's just say, $1. That was denied. We have done uh, summary judgment motions. The court ruled on it. There's only one issue that the court really has to decide. We are ready to pick a jury. You know, all those things that save the new judge time so they can come up to speed on what's going on. And I will almost bet my last dollar that a judge reads that, then a judge will say, thank you, Mr. Russell. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Grant, for submitting the summation of where we are today. It was very helpful. So now let's move on. This is important. Mm -hmm. And it could, it could influence, you know, the, the outcome. So there, there's some helpful advice if you're not fortunate enough to have Ed Prichardo Esquire or Royce Russell Esquire uh, working on your case. But now back to a story that we have been talking about for a couple of weeks, because unfortunately, uh, justice has not completely been served. So the ballistics reports are raising yeah. questions on Breonna Taylor's case. We will not let this go because I could be Breonna Taylor, you know, as a black woman, you know, we, it, it's just so many emotions that we're continuing to feel and to process and to go through when we look at what's being uncovered as more and more facts come out as this ballistic report has raised some additional questions, Mr. Russell is gonna break down a few of the things that highlights the disparities once again in dealing with this case. Well, let me do a flashback. I remember when I tried my first case in Broad County as a prosecutor. And I believe, actually it wasn't my first case, but it was a case. And I remember, uh, the way you should attack any uh, trial is you should attack it from the back end going forward. What do we mean by that? Or at least what do I mean by that? Is that you have a narrative of what you believe happened. And, and the reason why I say what you believe happened is because I am a proponent of the fact that I was not there. So I can't tell you exactly what happened. I can tell you a theory of what occurred and it may match up with the facts. And because it does match up with the facts, that's the theory that I am putting forth. But you always have to have a theme, a theory of what the case is about. And you let that be your marching orders throughout either your summations, throughout your arguments, throughout your questioning and answering of questions by witnesses or two witnesses. And one of the things that I remember this one case uh, and some of my colleagues who are now judges and didn't lose their job <laughs> always bring up is that I, I had this one submission that, that said stubborn facts. And what was stubborn was, was that in this shotgun robbery, the defendant's picture was taken. 
Mm. So you had his face. Now, why would a guy want to go to trial with his face? It's taken at the scene. You can see his picture. You can see him holding the shotgun, but he did. That's neither here nor there. Um, and so no matter what defense counsel said when I was a prosecutor at that time, no matter what his summation was, at the end of the day, that picture of his face at the location when the crime was being committed in some shape, form, or fashion linked him to the crime. And that is what we call a stubborn fact. It won't change. It can't change. It will not change. And I beat that saying down like a drum every single time I said a sentence. The robber had blue and white. This picture has blue and white. This is a stubborn fact. It won't change, it can't change, it will always stay the same. And why is it stubborn? Because no matter what you say, no matter if you tear it up, it's still gonna show the person with blue and white. If you ball it up, it's still gonna show the person with blue and white. If, if you set it on fire, we know that it was a picture of a person with blue and white. You can't change the picture to make it white and blue. It is a stubborn fact. Hence, the ballistic report. This is stubborn fact. It is what it is. Now we can talk about how did it become to be, and maybe that was manipulated, but now we got it. We have the four corners. So it is stubborn. It is not going to change. So no matter what facts you throw up against it, it has to correlate with the ballistics because the ballistics is not going to change. So there was an alleged comment by the state's attorney general, or attorney general, Daniel Cameron, who said that one of the officers uh, was hit by, um, hit by uh, Ken Walker, right? Ken Walker shot the police officer uh, that night. And so the ballistic reports almost contradicts that. I, I believe it said, uh, Taylor's death, well, let me just read it. It says that the ballistic report basically contradicts what the attorney general was putting out there. And that is important. So he put out there the assertion that Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, shot a police officer that night is goes against the ballistic report. So now there was some issue of whether or not it was friendly fire. fire. And so Cameron said Wednesday, this is his quote, Cameron said Wednesday, the investigation of Taylor's death, March 13, ruled friendly fire from Officer Brent Hankerson as a source of the shot that went through Sergeant Jonathan Madeline's thigh, prompting him and Officer Miles Cosgrove to return fire killing Taylor. That's what he said. So you would have to believe it's friendly fire, right? And the reason why this is important is because we hold the police accountable Hey, man, you can't shoot at us if one of your own shot at you. What are you, crazy? Like, that doesn't make sense. Now, he says this. The ballistic report comes back, and it reads differently. It says that Ken Walker, he's the one that shot Madeline. So, you know, this is a lesson of that when there's stubborn facts out there, you need to go with the facts and not try to shade or try to guide or try to mislead. And that's why the community is up in arms. Remember, on our last segment of Speaking Legally, I said it's about who, what, and when. Who said that they were gonna charge the officers with something other than what they were charged with, that being charging them with the death of Breonna Taylor? Who said that that, that was gonna be a charge that went into the grand jury? I got a funny feeling that the Attorney General never said that to anyone. I got a funny feeling that the community assumed based upon the fact that that would be something that would happen. And if he said it, then we need to hold him, hold his feet to the fire. But I got a, I got a funny feeling he didn't say it or else we would have heard advocates saying, you said you was gonna do A, you didn't do A, and now we have a problem. I will admit, once again, there's a business side of being in private practice. So I did not listen to the 15 hours of the grand jury testimony because I have a practice to run. That's the business side. So is the who, who said that they were gonna bring charges that were related to Breonna Taylor's death? 
as opposed to relating to the police officer's conduct in itself. If those statements were made, when were they made? Were they made prior to going in the grand jury? If they were made prior to going to the grand jury, then we have a problem because the ballistics and what went on in the grand jury does not compute. What do I mean by that? They were statements that this was a no-knock warrant. And how and there's a movement right now against no-knock warrants. I think there should be a movement against no-knock warrants. But what the grand jury testimony reveals is, is that some people said that they announced that he that the police announced themselves, and other people said that they didn't. And I'll just say police interviews with Taylor neighbors. Don't put to rest the concerns of whether Taylor and her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, knew that police were outside the apartment after midnight with narcotics warrants to search, search the home. Recordings show police reported knocking and identifying themselves for a minute or more before bursting in. If there's a recording and it's out there, that is what we call a stubborn crime. Now, once again, we can get into whether the recording was manipulated. Right. If there's a recording that's out there, that's a stubborn fact. So when we say, oh, they were supposed to, they didn't knock, they just rolled in, they just, that may not be true. What hmm. might be true is that they did say something. That does not alleviate their responsibility or liability to a degree. It makes it for a harder case on a civil level, and it might make it for a harder case on a criminal level to charge them with something. We already know that Madeline and Cosgrove was never charged with any crimes, and they weren't charged with any crimes because the crimes or the conduct, excuse me, the conduct that they use is that. I think what they did was criminal, but that's why you heard me say the crimes, but I do think what their conduct was criminal. However, it was shielded by self-defense. And it was shielded by self-defense, then you cannot charge them with something. And so now what are you left with? You're left with the conduct of this officer that you can trace back the bullets going through the wall, almost hitting neighbors. And then that's where you get the wanton and reckless. Now, should there be some perjury charges involved in here? Because folks, you know, the information about no not came from somewhere and it can only come from people in the police department that know about police things, right? So should there be some other charges here? We still haven't seen Hackinson's personal file, right? That's important because maybe he had other instances like this that public should know. And just right. because the case is settled, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't know it. Uh, now, here's a comment by Walker, allegedly. Walker said that he fired a single warning shot from his Glock handgun at Taylor's, in Taylor's apartment because he thought intruders were breaking in. Police said they identified themselves. They were attempting to serve a no-knock search warrant. So here we go. Somebody said from the police department that they were serving a no-knock search warrant. Right. How does the search warrant in its face, a stubborn fact, says knock and announce? Who is saying what? And is there some perjurious testimony that's going down for which someone should be liable? And that's why you need um, a prosecutor that thinks out of the box, in the box, around the box, um, to make sure that the community is served in the best way that it can be served. And just because someone is of color doesn't necessarily mean that they think in a way that is in the best interest of the community in particular situations. So once again, when we look at Breonna Taylor and we hear about the testimony of the grand jury and we hear about the things that's going on, we should always reflect on who, what, and when. And remember, stubborn facts. Mm -hmm. As Dion said, riddled with contradictions, it is. Hey, Shawnee, she says, speechless to say the least. This is why everybody's so frustrated and folks don't understand. Well, I should say not folks. Some people are choosing not to understand why we can't be silent, why this can't continue to happen. And all of these contradictions, like the truth, is starting to come out little piece by piece, contradiction by contradiction. And, you know, 
there's still a long way to go. In your opinion, Mr. Russell, the way the case is unfolding, how long do you think we're going to be fighting this fight? Um, you know, quite honestly, I don't know what the next level can be, except for an FBI investigation. Um, maybe an FBI investigation that presents a new theory as to the as to what I'm going to describe as the criminal conduct of the police officers, as to the conduct of the police officers, and we want to be liberal and lenient, and a decision is made as to uh, what was done that was of a criminal nature. But in the state level, it's a done deal because um, I don't want to say double jeopardy applies because double jeopardy is charging a person with the same crime twice uh, within one jurisdiction. Um, so that's not the case. But I think the attorney general will be hard pressed to look at all the evidence again and say, well, I want to go back in the grand jury if it's allowed in Kentucky and I want to present some new charges because that's prejudicial on his face. And that speaks volumes to political and community outcry. And I'm sure there will be a strong argument uh, from the defense side to say, hey, look, you went in the grand jury. There's nothing new that was said or done that you couldn't present in the grand jury the first time you went in there. There's no more political pressure. And clearly there's no more new facts because just because I read the ballistic report or the news outlet gleaned a little light into the ballistic report, you've had the ballistic report forever. So what's the problem? What's the dealio, my bro? What is the dealio? Oh, so, so sickening. Oh, we still have work to do. And that's why the groups that are on the ground advocating for justice, pushing for the reform that needs to happen, it, it's, it's so important because we are in a time where this has to effectuate change. Like it, it's just too much. And you know, we're about to close out the show, but I I stopped watching the news on a regular basis. I've never really watched, watch, watch the news. I get sound bites just to be updated on what's going on. FYI, please remember to complete the census before it's too late and to register to vote. So those are our two PSA announcements. And vote. But yeah, yeah, to make sure you register and vote. Exactly. You need to do both. And tonight we know it's the debate between the two vice presidential candidates. So um, as black women, we're excited to see uh, Senator Kamala Harris be able to be the vice president uh, nominee for the Democratic Party. So we want to make sure that you tune in there as well. Uh, Deborah said, they say the truth just set you free, but that doesn't happen when it comes to innocent black people. Ah, well, it hasn't happened the right way. We, we still have to keep pushing. Unfortunately, we're still getting more in the news about the unlawful deaths of black men. It, it's, we have to bring our friend on to talk about the trauma. Yeah. I we have to bring Dr. Gardner on. We have to talk about, because now people are almost being desensitized to what they're seeing because it's happening in such rapid pace. Um, we'll look into his schedule and just bring him on because he's been definitely sought out on his opinion on what's happening and the trauma that is repeated over and over again when these stories come in the news. Well, let me just uh, make sure that folks know that they can focus their energy by joining, looking up, participating, volunteering their time to a couple of organizations that are out here, uh, feet in the street, as I call it. You have Until Freedom, that's one organization. And I know I'm gonna leave some out, so there's gonna be some people that are mad, but so be it. Uh, you have Until Freedom, you have the National Action Network, you have Justice Committee, uh, you have Gathering of Justice, you have uh, Justice League NYC, you have Cop Watch, you have the Black Women's March, um, you have Breathe. So there are a variety of organizations out here. You have the Arc of Justice or the Arc for Justice. There are a variety of organizations out here that folks can get involved in and with, or at least have an understanding that they exist and create another or join forces with. I know that the resources are out there. And so that's my tip for today. Well, I just want to share some information. I had to look it up. Uh, we're hosting the New York State Black Women for Biden Harris is having a pre-debate 
event that I will be emceeing tonight. So you can go to Instagram, uh, NY, NYS Black Women, the number four Biden Harris. They have an Instagram page. As a matter of fact, I might just pull that up so you can support that. There are a couple of other watch parties going on for this vice presidential debate tonight. So let's support. Once again, complete your census. Please go out there, register to vote. You have another day, I believe, day two, what's the day? Yes, you, so time's running out in New York. Check your local state to make sure that you're registered to vote and make sure you help those who need to get to the polls, get to the polls. If you have to drive them, volunteer, do something, we cannot sit this one out. And thank you, Deborah. She says she's got involved with Community Board 12 for your neighborhood, awesome. Thank you, Shawnee, for the birthday blessings. I appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in to the show. Uh, as we know, Ed was on earlier, but he's tending to business uh, up in Albany. So shout out to all of you who are here viewing. He's making fun. sure he get one of those uh, 46 vacancies that now left over here. Yeah, <laughs> I got a, he's on a watch list right now. But I, also, watch list. I, I also want to say uh, to Mr. Russell, I didn't forget your question in reference to jury duty in New Jersey. Um, I'll get right back at you either by DM or I'll mention it on the show so our audience can hear whether or not in the state of New Jersey, the employer has to pay you for serving on jury duty. That is a state by state uh, rule and regulation and in New York uh, to make to ensure that folks participate in jury duty. That's one of the things that uh, was enacted. But here in Jersey, it appears that folks are always are ready to go to jury duty. So there's really no need to, to enforce that, but I'll get right back at you, all right? All right, and thank you all for tuning in. Dion, welcome to the show. Deborah, thank you. Uh, Richard, thank you. Shawnee, uh, who else we had out here? I didn't, Dan, we appreciate all of you tuning in today. Be safe out there, wash your hands, wear your mask. We see what's going on. We've even touched on that today, but just be careful, use wisdom and stay involved. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you same time, same place, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time next week, Wednesday. Deuces.